Father in heaven, as we open your word this morning, I ask that um, for some, maybe for whom this passage has been perplexing or confusing, that the scales would fall from our eyes this morning, we would see Jesus, we would see and understand the work he's doing now and how important this verse is to us as Seventh-day Adventists, especially in this time of earth's history. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we know it very well. Probably many of you could just recite it by heart, but let's, and if you want to, that's fine too. It says, he said to me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed or purified. Yes. Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. It, why is it that Ellen White called Daniel 8.14 both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith? So it's both. It's the foundation. Of course, Jesus is the foundation, right? But it's his work that we're talking about. So it's the foundation and the central pillar of our faith. He's the foundation, and Daniel 8.14 is all about what Jesus is doing now. But before we get right to a study of this verse, I need to rewind the clock 40 years. Actually, um, it was almost 41 years ago now, the summer of 1978. I was not a believer. Um, I was actually an atheist in high school. I went from, from atheism to had a, quite an interesting journey that I don't have time to go into. But someone handed me the book, The Great Controversy. And I thought I should know something about the Bible. Educated people do. And so I accepted it. And I was told to find a chapter halfway through that looked interesting and read to the end. That's an interesting way to give someone a book, isn't it? But the Lord knows everything. He knows that was really the best thing for me because I went through the table of contents and I saw um, a chapter called The Origin of Evil that looked interesting to me, so that's where I started. And as I read The Great Controversy, I was amazed. First of all, it was just as if God and I were having a conversation. An objection would come into my mind and the next page or paragraph, there would be a beautiful answer to that objection. Another objection, objection after objection, answer after answer. It was something I cannot describe, the power of that. But the most amazing thing of all was the fulfillment of Bible prophecy because in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, God says, I am God and there is none else. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. There's no other book like the Bible. There's no other sacred book like the Bible that is, has the biblical prophecies accurately uh, foretold in advance and fulfilled in history. This is unique. And the most amazing prophecy for me of all was Daniel 9. Because right there in, in the Hebrew Bible, the, the Jews' own Bible is about the Messiah. It mentions Mashiach, Messiah. The Messiah, the Prince, would come. And not only that he would come, but when he would come, exactly when he would be anointed by the Holy Spirit as baptism, the very year, A.D. 27, that in the midst of the week he would put an end to sacrifice and offering. He would be cut off, but not for himself. It means he would, he would die. And not only that, but he would, he, would be, he would die the death that we should have died as sinners. He, would, he died for me. He died for you. Amazing prophecy accurately fulfilled in history. I went, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I went to the encyclopedias, I checked, checked the history, and it was correct. Amazing. And uh, 
I realized that the sanctuary, because Daniel 8.14 is connected with Daniel 9. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I realized that the sanctuary system given by God was given so that we would understand the way to eternal life and it was put in such a way step by step so none of us need to lose our way that Romans 3 verse 25 actually in the new and uh, new revised standard version it says that God through his son he set him forth as the sacrifice of atonement sacrifice the Hilesterion is the word in Greek. It means the place of mercy. The, the, it was his sacrifice that opened the way for us. And only a God of love, I realized, could devise answers to questions I had not even asked and could make a way that, of salvation that a sinful human heart could never devise, let alone fathom and it will be our study for eternity. Are you thankful for Jesus this morning? Amen. That he is not only the place of a, the sacrifice of atonement, but it is, was all done, Romans 3.26 says, so that God could be just, could be seen to be just, and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. That God might be just. That's what the great controversy is all about. That's why we're still here. To show that God is just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. As Jesus died on the cross, there was an unseen hand, not unlike maybe the unseen hand that wrote on the, the wall in Belshazzar's palace. A hand that tore the veil in the sanctuary, the temple in Jerusalem, when Jesus died, A.D. 31, right on time according to prophecy. The veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. God was giving a message from heaven to earth that that was fulfilled. The purpose of these sacrifices was fulfilled in the death of Jesus on the cross. And the cross, you know, was a cross for even Jesus' disciples. You know, many Jews failed to accept what Jesus said. But even for the 12 disciples, it was not understood. They didn't understand. They were greatly disappointed when Jesus died. And uh, that great disappointment, they, so what did they do? They didn't give up their faith, but they, they prayed. And then Jesus came and he opened their eyes. He, he had told them actually three times that he would die, right? He had told them. It wasn't something that had not been revealed. But because of popular ideas, their eyes couldn't see the fulfillment of prophecy. They had hoped, as the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24 says, we had hoped that he was the one that would deliver Israel. And Jesus said, oh, slow of heart to believe, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and then afterward entered his glory? So uh, the cross was something that the disciples had to understand more clearly. And as the popular ideas had interfered. Jesus had to clear up those things. And they, they understood that he was, he was entering into a new phase of work for them. 
He said, I go to my father, your father and my father. I ascend, and I will be there. I will be your, your advocate, right? In the, heavenly, in the heavenly sanctuary. So their clearer understanding came at the end of the 70-week prophecy as it was uh, coming to an end. And we see something similar with the fulfillment of Daniel 8, 14. You probably didn't know whether, how I was going to connect that, right? But this is how. Because at the end of the 2300 evenings and mornings, the, the prophecy of Daniel 8, 14, there was a great disappointment. People were, were disappointed. They thought Jesus was going to come. They thought he was coming in glory to establish his kingdom, not unlike the disciples. They expected him to come and reign. But that's because they thought the sanctuary was the earth and be, it would be cleansed by fire. But that's not what actually Daniel 8 says. And if we would connect it, actually, Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, we could see that there is a clear order. There's the little horn is described in both chapters. Then there's a judgment scene. And um, then the kingdom is given to the saints of the Most High. In Daniel 7, that Daniel scene, uh, that uh, judgment scene in Daniel 7 is in Daniel 7, 9 to 14. And it says that the Son of Man, verse 13, I saw in the night vision, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came where? To the Ancient of Days, not to the earth. He came, by the way, it also says in verse 9 that thrones were placed, cast down or placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. So that means God the Father was moving, right? And when Jesus, it says the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, that means he was moving, right? Going somewhere. He was going from the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. This is what Daniel saw in vision. And, and, and John in the book of Revelation also sees a vision of the heavenly sanctuary. We don't have time to get into that, but there was something new that took place at the end of the 2300 days. And but it was the acceptance of popular ideas in 1844 that led early Adventists to misunderstand what this prophecy was about, what event was about to happen. But, and it was necessary that through a spirit-guided study of the scriptures that they would come to understand. And the Holy Spirit opened their eyes to what the meaning of these prophecies was. And they had a clear understanding that enabled them not only to understand Daniel 8, but the companion passage in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, that they had proclaimed on time, but hadn't understood. The everlasting gospel, fear God, give glory to him for what? The hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. They came to understand these things. And um, so, but Daniel didn't understand all of these things. At the end of the book, he asks, what shall be the end of these things? And he is told, go thy way, Daniel, verse nine, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end, till the time of the end. Only after the fulfillment of key events would this prophecy be understood, in other words. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 19, now before it comes to pass, I tell you when it does come to pass that you may believe that I am he. And in his outline of the future that Jesus gave in Matthew 24, he pointed back actually to the book of Daniel, right? And what did he say? Let the reader understand. Why? Because Daniel's prophecy, as we saw, Daniel 9 was being fulfilled at that very time. And in Matthew 24, he also talks about the destruction of the city and the sanctuary, the temple, which is what Daniel 9 ends with, refers actually to the, the, at the time Daniel 9 was written, Jerusalem and the temple was a ruin already. Daniel 9 talks about it being rebuilt. 
But then, interestingly, after it talks about it being rebuilt, it talks about it being destroyed again. Jesus was saying, understand. Of course, it was at this, it was already clear that he was not being accepted by the Jewish leadership, that the city and sanctuary would be destroyed again. He said, how often would I have gathered you, but you would not. Your house is left unto you desolate. So, Jesus pointed us to the prophecy of Daniel. And it's interesting, if we look at Revelation chapter 10, we see a very similar picture of Jesus. It's if we compare, he's called a mighty angel, but he's the archangel, the ruler of the angels. He came and uh, his face was as it were the sun, his feet as pillar of fire, Revelation 10 verse one. He had in his hand a little book open. He set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth and cried with a loud voice and so on. So this is a description of Jesus. And his feet on the sea and on the land indicate that he is ruler of heaven and earth. This is the Lord of heaven and earth as it says in the Old Testament many times. These experiences of Daniel, not understanding, notice is repeated with John. He's told to take the book, eat it. It'll be in his mouth sweet and bitter in his stomach, right? So both Daniel not understanding, John not understanding. They're, they sort of personify God's people at these key times of the full, full fulfillment of Daniel 9 with Jesus and his death and Daniel 8, 14 with the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. And that's why in Revelation 11, verse 1, Oh, actually, let's go to 10, verse 11 first. He said to me, because in his belly it was bitter, he did, it was a bitter experience, bitter disappointment. He said to me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Thou must prophesy again. So, what does that mean? There's only one other time in Revelation where we find a message that must be given to many peoples, nations, and tongues. Where is that? Come on. Revelation 14, yes, verse six. Okay, first angel's message. To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So, and it's the only place that it, these verses are clearly connected. Revelation 10, verse 11, and Revelation 14, verse six. And uh, then this time the message would be given in light of an increased understanding of the sanctuary gained through studying the temple because chapter 11, verse one, the very next verse after chapter 10, verse 11, John is told, he, he's given a rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure what? The temple, the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So in other words, understand just what Jesus said. Understand, study, measure the temple, the sanctuary. They were pointed to the sanctuary as the key, the temple in heaven. And at the end of the chapter, this key verse in Revelation 19, the next time the temple in heaven is mentioned here, it says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings, etc." Amazing. This, as I came to understand the fulfillment of these prophecies and how the great disappointment was actually predicted in Revelation chapter 10 and its solution here in Revelation chapter 11, it was, it was amazing to me. I was now on the way to faith. I began to understand this complete system of truth that the great controversy speaks about complete system of truth, connected and harmonious. As I was following the footsteps of the pioneers studying these prophecies, everything fit together. The sanctuary was the heart and central pillar of the Advent faith, I understood that. Those who receive the seal of God 
in Revelation will keep all his commandments, including the Seventh-day Sabbath, because it's written in their minds. It's written in their hearts. As uh, Jeremiah 31 says, Revela uh, Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, the new covenant promise, I will write their, my laws in their minds, in their hearts. In contrast to those who are sealed, Revelation pictures those who receive the mark of the beast. We don't ha obviously have time to go into the difference there in very much detail, but it's interesting that the remnant mentioned at the end of chapter 12 are those who keep the commandments of God, have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 14, verse 12, again, Though just before Jesus comes, which is pictured at the last part of Revelation 14, it says, here is the patience of the saints, verse 12. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I, I so much appreciated the children's story this morning. You know, obedience. Um, do we ever grow out of the need to obey? We don't because we're children of God. Very important. Keep the commandments of God. And of course, the Sabbath, we're here this morning because that is one of those Ten Commandments. The Sabbath, it's crucial. I was deeply impressed by the fact that here in Revelation 14 and Revelation 7, it's very clear that the 144,000, those who receive the seal of God, are those who keep the commandments, including the Sabbath, which is at the heart of the Ten Commandments, explains who God is as ruler of heaven and earth, creator of the heaven and earth, in six days rested on the seventh day. It's, it's the sign and seal of our relationship to him, the Sabbath is. And it is the seal of God. It will be given. Those who receive the mark of the beast will not be manifesting that sign of obedience, that sign of connection with heaven. And that was also important to me as, a, as a, a person on the way to faith, studying the Bible, because I, as an atheist, one of the reasons that I dismissed Christianity was because of its atrocious history. And I use that word deliberately. There were atrocities, millions of people martyred, burned at the stake through Christian history. How could God, how could they be the people of God? How could God condone that? And then I realized, as I was studying Revelation, there's not one woman in the book of Revelation, there are two. There's this pure woman in Revelation chapter 12, clothed with the sun, this light of God's glory, representing his character and truth that they shine as the light of the world as Jesus calls us to be. And there's a second woman, Revelation 17, a harlot, holding the golden cup of the sanctuary in her hand, filled with the wine of Babylon, this confusion and confusing teachings and doctrines, and drunk with the blood of the saints. the blood of God's people. Not just a few sprinkles here and there, drunk with the blood of the saints. What a terrible picture. God, and I discovered God does not own Christian history and we don't have to look back at Christian history and somehow try to explain. No, it's already explained. Already, and if we had time, we could look at the 1260 day prophecy. It's also mentioned in Revelation 12 twice, and also Revelation 13, in case we didn't quite get it, this 1,260 year period, because a day in symbolic prophecy represents a year of time, real time. When did that end? 1798, with the capture of the Pope by Napoleon, Berthier, uh, the, the general, Berthier, and took, imprisoned him and broke the power of the church, the state 
control of the church. Broke it. And after that, after that period, it says, there would be signs, right? Okay, actually leading up to the end, signaling the end of that period. And also afterward, 1833, the falling of the stars, and then the rise of the remnant. God, God calls this remnant into existence. That is those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 17. So that's history. We don't, we, God doesn't claim that history as his. We don't need to claim that history as ours. We have a different history. God raised us up at a very specific point in earth's history in order to fulfill the three angels' message commission. This is the great commission applied to the end time, Revelation 14. Jesus' commission, it's actually the revelation of whom? Jesus Christ. Never forget that. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. So the commission, Revelation 14, is a commission from Jesus Christ, isn't it? So as I studied these prophecies, Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Revelation 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, it became so obvious to me that the fulfillment of prophecy was pointing to the fact that the Seventh Adventist Church is the only true church because it was raised up by God in fulfillment of Bible prophecy to proclaim, proclaim the third angel's message and uh, that all of these chapters, these prophecies were clear and convincing. Crystal clear and convincing, coherent. I saw that Indeed, the sanctuary, understanding the heavenly sanctuary, what Jesus is doing now, opens to view a complete system of truth, connected and harmonious. Another surprise was, however, that, and I won't go into great detail of this, but I was, you remember I was baptized in 1978. It's a, and then I went, I decided I hadn't learned anything I really needed to know for eternity and, and uh, I didn't have a Christian education, didn't have an Adventist education growing up. I wanted one. I wanted to know these things more deeply. So I went to Pacific Union College in Northern California in 1978, the fall. I, I uh, began studying there. And... Um, one of the professors there was by the name of Desmond Ford. Passed away recently. I, I want to be respectful, but to be honest, he did great damage to people's faith in the scriptures, in the fulfillment of prophecy, in our understanding of the heavenly sanctuary and the meaning of Daniel 8, 14, its fulfillment in 1844. And despite, on the one hand, saying the writings of Ellen White are a good devotional source, undermining their authority, their spiritual authority. God gave that gift to his last day people. So, of course, not only Desmond Ford, many have taught against this sanctuary doctrine. And, but that's okay. There will always be those who oppose what God is doing in the earth. But I found through, you know, study, and I said to myself, okay, I need to study more deeply. This was an invitation for me. If I had been deceived, I wanted to be the first to know. So I restudied and I studied and I came to a clearer understanding even and, and I became convinced and through the years of study of this topic, I've become convinced that this is even more solid and more uh, demonstrable than I had initially thought. Even though I was persuaded, I have become more persuaded through the years. 
And I don't have time to go into all the details of this, but I encourage you to go to our website at Biblical Research Institute. You probably knew that there would be this. I would have to tell you our website, right? It's okay, okay, I hope you don't mind. AdventistBiblicalResearch.org. AdventistBiblicalResearch.org. Go there and you can find much more information about this important and vital topic that we don't have time to cover, including will be um, sort of a longer version of what I am sharing this morning. Why is this subject so important? How does it impact my life now? Because if we are following Jesus now, that means that we will follow Jesus in what he's doing now for us in the heavenly sanctuary. We will understand what he's doing and it will matter to us in our lives. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. Great Controversy, page 488. Great Controversy, page 488. Maybe, it's, yeah, there it is. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge, how many? All. All, All need a knowledge for, what? themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. We can't rely on the pastor or the elder or a Bible teacher. <clears throat> All need a knowledge. And I'm even looking at some of the younger children here this morning. All. You can understand this. You know, sometimes the 2300 days is... Um, Okay, I see people looking at their watch and I better uncover my watch. <laughs> it was covered up. I, um, I, sometimes the 2300 days is, is described as something that, you know, one of these so topics that so yeah, hard to understand, right? No, it is not hard to understand. But it is if we don't try, if we don't make an attempt to understand it. It's impossible. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of the great high priest. Why? Otherwise, it will be what? Impossible for them to exercise what? The faith, and notice that is connected with faith. The faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. We need to follow Jesus at every stage in his work of salvation. Stage one, his sacrifice at the cross. This was his work of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He made him, that is God made him, Jesus who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's, that's all the sacrifices of the sanctuary point to that one most vital and only sacrifice by which we can be saved. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, 21, Hebrews 13, verse 10. Stage two. Stage two. So Jesus is now he ascended to heaven after his death on the cross he, and resurrection. He ascended to heaven. And he began work in the, mo, in the holy place, the heavenly sanctuary. And this focuses on his work of justification, which means accepting the blood of Jesus to cover my sins. First John 2, 1, right? If anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And two, the gift of a new heart. Justification includes transformation. Titus 3, verses 5 through 7. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That having been justified by faith, we might be 
become heirs of eternal life. Justification. Stage three, what's he doing now? The most holy place. The focus is on sanctification, which emphasizes obedience to God's commandments, especially the Sabbath rest, the cleansing of God's people, and the blotting out of the record of their sins. The most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And stage four, when the high priest was finished in his work of cleansing the sanctuary, he came out to bless the people. The focus is on glorification and the second coming of Christ. When he's finished with his work in the heavenly sanctuary, in the most holy place, his work of judgment, he will, and the blood of sins, he will put on his kingly robes, come in glory and power to resurrect his people who are sleeping in the grave and translate those who live to see him come, bestowing on them the finishing touch of immortality. So four stages. <laughs> Reconciliation, the cross. Stage one, that's stage one. Stage two, the holy place focuses on justification. Stage three, the most holy place. His work focuses on sanctification. And stage four, the second coming and glorification, the finishing touch of immortality. Our salvation depends on our willingness to follow Jesus at each stage. By faith, looking forward to the second advent, being ready to receive the finishing touch of immortality. Now, unfortunately, some at each of these four stages were not able to follow Jesus at, in his work at that time. Each of the four stages, we see that. After Jesus' death on the cross, many Jews refused to accept him as the Messiah and his atoning death as the sacrifice for their sins. After Jesus' ascension, some Jewish Christians clung to the temple services instead of following Jesus through the new and living way into the heavenly sanctuary and looking by faith to his intercession in the holy place as their advocate and mediator, we read that in the book of Hebrews. Don't cast away, therefore, the, your confidence, which has great recompense reward. And then after 1844, stage three, most holy place, when Jesus entered, some Adventists refused to follow Jesus by faith into the most holy place, even some still today. Rejecting his day of atonement ministry with its emphasis on obedience to all of God's commandments, including the seventh day Sabbath. And what about four, when Jesus comes again? As the New Testament indicates, in fact, Jesus himself, he asked the question in Luke 18, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith on the earth? He doesn't answer that question in the Gospels. But I am thankful that he answers that question in Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There will be a people, but some of Jesus' professed followers will be unready to meet him, as Jesus said and as Paul warns us in 1 Thessalonians 5. So, each stage there were people that could not follow Jesus. From the beginning there were, has been opposition to this message of the judgment in heaven and Christ's cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. And that will continue. And probably we shouldn't be surprised that it will intensify to the end. There will continue to be opposition to it. Notice this statement in the Great Controversy, page 435. Many and earnest were the efforts made to overthrow there the early Adventist faith. None could fail to see that an acceptance of the truth concerning the heavenly sanctuary involved an acknowledgement of what? The claims of God's law and the obligation of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Here was the secret of the bitter and determined opposition to the harmonious exposition of the scriptures that revealed the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Men sought to close the door which God had opened. What door was that? 
into the heavenly sanctuary, into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, right? The men sought to close the door which God had opened and to open the door which he had closed. He had closed the door into the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and opened the door into the most holy place. And, but some wanted to close that door and reopen. It was like they wanted to rewind the clock. They wanted to go back to that long period of 1260 years of apostasy. By the way, the Reformation was part of that period. We don't need to go backward. We need to follow Jesus now going forward in time. Next slide. But he that openeth, who's that? Jesus. He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth, had declared what? Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Christ had opened the door or ministration of the most holy place. Light was shining from that open door of the sanctuary in heaven and the fourth command was shown to be included in the law which is there enshrined. What God had established, no man could overthrow. Amen? Well, I'm looking at the clock. We need to just sort of skip through some of these slides very quickly. The purpose of Jesus' ministry in the heavenly sanctuary now in the most holy place is to prepare us for heaven. Some of us have been to other countries. It's very different from the culture and country that we know here in America. Some of us have lived in different cultures. It's not easy to live in a different culture, speak a different language. Are we prepared to enter heaven? It's a very different place. You know, we have a hard time understanding what that must be like. When we read about Eden in Genesis 1 and 2 and the ideal, and the New Testament also in places points us back to the ideal right now. We have a hard time understanding what that must be like. Matthew 5 talks about Blessed, the blessings of those who follow Jesus and follow him, what it means to follow him. Sensing our continual need, verse 3, that is the poor in spirit. Being meek and merciful, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, being pure in heart, being a source of peace, peacemaker rather than conflict, source of peace, being the salt of the earth, the light of the world, going the second mile, turning the other cheek. That's a hard one for a lot of us, I, myself included. Loving your enemies and praying, Jesus says, for your enemies. Being perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So if none of those other ones were hard enough, what does Jesus do? He makes it even harder. It's, why? Why does he do that? Why does Jesus make this so hard? Being perfect, how can anyone be perfect as their Father in heaven is perfect? How can that be? The only way it can be is like what Jesus said, you must be born again. Right? You must be born. That's a miracle. It's a, a miracle that changed me from an atheist to an Adventist. That's a miracle. A miracle of God. It's not something I could do. That's for sure. Only a miracle. And that's what we need every step of our Christian walk, following Jesus. And he promises, here are just a few of the promises. Philippians 1, six. being confident of this very thing, confident, have faith in this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Who will complete the work? Jesus. He who has begun, God, who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.13, it is who? God who works in you both, both to will and to do. Even if I don't, want to do something. When I pray to the Lord, I know it's right, but I pray to the Lord, 
He gives me a willingness, a willing heart, a willing spirit to do it. Strength to do it. First Thessalonians 5.24, he who called you is faithful, who also will do it. Jude 24, God is able to keep you from falling. I'm not able to keep myself from falling, but God is able, not only able to keep you from falling, but to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. What a beautiful promise that is, huh? Jude 24. So as we follow Jesus, the bar is high. So high that the only way it's possible is by faith. It's the only way. I, this morning, I, I read a uh, today's reading in the book Conflict and Courage. It's a, it's a beautiful book, Conflict and Courage. It's very interesting that it was this morning's reading. Do you believe that we are on the borders of the heavenly Canaan, the promised land? I believe that with all my heart. The signs, most all of them have been fulfilled. We see in the world and in the church signs of prophecy fulfilling. And when Israel in the wilderness came up to the borders of the promised land, Kadesh Barnea. Twelve were sent in and came back with a report. And most, ten out of twelve, what did they say? The walls are high, walled up, cities walled up to heaven. There are giants in the land. We saw the sons of Anak there. And we were in our sight as grasshoppers. But there was a different report by Caleb and Joshua. In Joshua chapter 14, well, actually we could even go back to the, in numbers, but we won't do it. But Caleb and Joshua, they said, we are well able God will bless us. He will give us the ability to take the land, possess it. That was their report. No problem with God. He's promised it. He will deliver it. Notice, 40 years later, actually longer, 45, he says, verse 10. The Lord has kept me alive, Joshua 14, 10, as he said, these 40 and 5 years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. Eighty-five. Verse 11. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Please advance to the next slide. Both to go out and to come in. And now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there and the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And of course we know that that is what happened. I have tried to bring back, this is Ellen White after her first vision, I have tried to bring back a good report and a few grapes from the heavenly Canaan for which many would stone me as the congregation bade stone Caleb and Joshua for their report. But I declare to you, my brethren and sisters in the Lord, it is a goodly land and we are well able to go up and possess it. Well, thank you for bearing with me these, these moments together. But I believe that we are on the borders of the promised land, the heavenly Canaan. We are well able to go up and possess. This is what it says. We, speaking of us today, are well able to go up and possess it. May the Lord give us the faith of Joshua, Caleb and Joshua, the faith of Jesus, Revelation fourteen twelve to allow God to fulfill his word through us. I don't want to 
retire here on earth. You know, I, I'm getting to the age where I have to think about those things, but I want to be in heaven. I want to see Jesus face to face. How many here have that same desire? Not to, not to stay here, but to see Jesus face to face, to step into heaven. Amen. May that be our experience. God bless you.